So thank you very much. Um, so my name is Alice Hutchings and thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'd also like to thank, before I start, Richard Clayton, who is the director of the Cybercrime Centre and who I did this research with. So a little bit about me, because I'm probably unknown to a lot of people in the audience. Um, I've always had an interest in computers and I received my first computer when I was eight years old and my dad upgraded at work, so he gave me his hand-me-downs. In late 1990s, I started working in brand protection and I started getting really interested in the research um, relating to domain name misuse. I also did some work for Microsoft and um, had quite a lot of cases involving the sale of counterfeit software. So it wasn't until the noughties that I went to university and there I did a year of research looking at phishing victimization. So I was interested in the risk factors for why some people received a phishing email and also why people responded. I then moved um, for my PhD research from looking at victimization to offenders and I expanded the range of criminal activities I was looking at, but I really want to explain why some people began offending, why they continued and also why they stopped. Towards the end of my PhD, I started working at the Australian Institute of Criminology, also doing cybercrime research. I looked at a variety of things there, organised crime, crime in the cloud, child sexual offending, identity theft, consumer fraud, um, and communication confidentiality. In 2014, I started working at the University of Cambridge. Uh, since then, I've been involved in a variety of projects, um, including stolen data markets, the online sale of pharmaceuticals, um, denial of service attacks and website takedown. And I've also set up a database of cybercrime events in the UK where there's been an arrest, um, prosecution, uh, and also when somebody's been um, charged. So it's available on my website. Um, so, there's a little photo of me taken at a hacker conference back in 2013, just before I left Australia. Um, as you can see, I've just won the Best Beard Award. I don't think they actually hold this competition since then. Um, I'd first gone to this conference in 2008, um, but I found the experience quite alienating. And I found that since then, um, the experience and Hacker Conference has really improved, and I'm really grateful for that. So I promised that I'd be talking about Buddha services, so let's get started. So this is an example of a Buddha service login page. Now, this is an interesting one because the source code for Rage Buddha was actually leaked back in 2013. So m many of the Buddha services that are out there have very similar looking pages. So this is a customer facing site. You can Go there, register, in order to use the services. And the type of services they provide are denial of service attacks for a fee. Now, Buddha services are also referred to as stressor services because they used can be used for stressing networks to see how they stand up to denial of service attacks. However, we use the term Buddha services because they more accurately reflect how they're used, which is usually to boot people off gaming sites and to take down TeamSpeak servers. So they offer a range of different types of subscription options. Um, here we see that it ranges from $5 to $150 US dollars per month. And $5 can buy you as many 300 seconds denial of service attacks as you'd like. Most services accept PayPal. Other common payment methods include Bitcoin and some accept credit cards. Now there's quite a large range of Buddha services that are out there. However, there are a small number that have, you know, really gained popularity and been um, brought out in the media in recent years. So one was operated by Lizard Squad, a hacking group known for denial of service attacks against gaming companies. They set up Lizard Stressor, which operated for only a, two, a few weeks in 2015 before it was hacked and the client list leaked. This allowed police 
to actually go and visit those who had registered to use the service. So for example, in the UK, National Crime Agency went and visited 50 people who had registered, or over 50 people, and they arrested six. One of those has since been sentenced, perhaps because he also attempted to import a handgun. He was 17 years old, and he received a 12-month sentence in a young offenders institution. He was ordered to pay the victim of the denial of service attack £1,000 in compensation. So another, you know, UK police have not really been silent in this area, so unrelated apparently to Lizard Squad, there's been another booter service provider who has actually been um, convicted in the UK. A 20-year-old man earlier this year pleaded guilty to six charges under the Computer Misuse Act and four charges under the Serious Crime Act. He operated booter services and had over 12,000 registered users. Over 4,000 of them had requested attacks, and there'd been over 600,000 attacks on over 224,000 um, targets. He received a two-year sentence, which was suspended for 18 months. He was required to undertake 100 hours of unpaid work, and he was, he was also ordered to pay 800 pounds costs. So back to Lizard Stressor, or Lizard Squad, there's been some recent developments uh, in recent weeks. So two 19-year-olds, um, it's been announced, are arrested in the United States and the Netherlands for allegedly running booter services that were, op that were somehow linked back to Lizard Squad. It's also alleged that they ran a phone bombing service, so sending abuse over the phone, um, and sold stolen payment data. And that's one of the... Um, alleged operators there. And so, of course, I can't talk about recent developments without mentioning BDOS. So in September, so just last month, Brian Krebs put up a blog post, and he advised that he had a leaked VDOS database that, that he'd had it since July 2006, and it claimed it contained entries on tens of thousands of users and more than 150,000 attacks. The database apparently goes back two years and he claims that in that period the operators had more, made more than 600,000 US dollars. He further alleged that the service was being operated by two young men in Israel with support from several others in the UK. So hours later, after this blog post was um, put up, the two young men that allegedly ran, ran VDOS had been arrested in Israel. So Brian Preds announced this a couple of days later, and this was immediately followed by a flurry of media reporting that Brian Krebs website was under attack by the largest denial of service attack ever seen. Akamai, who had been protecting Brian Krebs' website for free, stopped doing so after it began affecting their paying customers. And here you can see Brian Krebs saying that he totally understands why that was the case. On the 30th of September, so just 18 days ago, the source code for Mirai, for the botnet res apparently responsible for the denial of service attack against Brian, against Brian Krebs, was released. This kind of adds the cat and mouse game that's computer security. Apparently, it was released due to increased scrutiny by security researchers, as well as by ISPs who had started disconnecting infected devices. So I'm sure many of you know the botnet uses internet connected, or internet of things, cameras and recorders um, with default passwords to launch attacks. So let's just move tack for a little bit and have a look at some of the pathways for cybercrime that I had come up with earlier. So this is looking at how cybercrime offenders become involved, why they continue, and why they stop. So in relation to cybercrime offenders in general, I identified two distinct 
pathways into their criminality. General cybercrime offenders use computers to carry out their offences, but not at an advanced level. On the other hand, we have technical cybercrime offenders, and these require specialist knowledge and understanding of computer systems. And unsurprisingly, they have different pathways in how they come involved in criminality. The general pathway starts with some kind of exposure to strain. This could be economic, employment problems, mental health problems, some kind of addiction such as gambling and drugs. And they can be combined with a presented opportunity such as in the workplace. So they're usually striving for some goals such as monetary gain or the gratification of other drivers. And they use innovative means to do this. General cybercrime offenders generally operate alone, but they can obtain methods and inspirations from elsewhere. On the other hand, we have the technical pathway, and these primarily operate with other people. The pathways towards criminality is offending through association with others, both online and offline. Online communities, for example, are used for learning and sharing information and ideologies, recruitment, and trading tools. With an interest in computers or gaming, um, they would be offenders begin by communicating online. They learn the techniques for committing cybercrime, as well as they share the definitions and techniques of neutralization that justify or excuse their behaviours to themselves and enable offending to occur. So maintenance follows a rational choice perspective. Common to both trajectories, offending behaviour is maintained because of the benefits accrued by the offenders as well as a low level of risk. So offenders perceive the likelihood of being detection is low and this has greater weight than the availability of valuable punishments, the harshness of valuable punishments. So benefits obtained from general offending are usually financial in nature, while well, those engaged in technical offending can enjoy a wider range of benefits. So these include skill development, fun, excitement, social status, power, and in some cases, even sexual gratification. Desistance also follows a rational choice perspective. So I found that offenders desist from cybercrime when they no longer receive those benefits or when the costs outweigh the benefits. So here, again, it's not only financial benefits, but includes no longer experience excitement or a sense of achievement from their actions. Again, the cost to offenders is not limited by punishment meted out by the criminal justice system. As offenders believe the likelihood of detection is low, the costs associated with offending are mainly social in nature. This includes the amount of time they spend online, which can interfere with legitimate employment or intimate relationships. Costs also include a feeling of guilt or shame, which may have previously been mediated by not being in physical contact with victims. However, once stopped, offenders may return to the maintenance stage and resume their activities if the balance of costs and benefits is in favour of the latter. So that kind of brings us to where we are today, but I'm going to reverse back time a little bit, back to 2014. And I was sitting in my office chatting with Richard Clayton, and we'd just been reading a paper by uh, Karami and McCoy who analysed a leaked booted database. And we started wondering about who were providing these services, why, and how it came about. So for as, as a social scientist, I find this is really one of the incredibly rewarding aspects of working with computer scientists, as I would have been unlikely to have explored this topic if I hadn't been where I was, and certainly not before it became newsworthy with a lizard stressor service. 
So previous work had concentrated on the technical side, analyzing leaked databases from services. And this was really missing, I felt, the social aspects. I thought it was unlikely that people just kind of woke up and said, what am I going to do today? I'm going to get up, have a shower, have breakfast, brush my teeth, check my emails, walk the dog, and maybe, you know, set up a Buddha service. Operators need to understand what denial of service attacks are. They need to have the technical expertise to actually set up these services and carry them out. And they also need to understand how to monetize the service and actually have some kind of benefit out of it. So we're kind of speculating about this and we decided, well, you know, the best thing to do is to ask them, ask the providers. And so we did. We compiled a list of all Buddha services, and this was done through searching the web and analysing the forums where Buddha services are usually advertised. So one example here is um, hack forums. We obtained a sample size initially of 63 services. I mainly contacted them through the online, forum, uh, online forms provided on their customer-facing sites for technical or billing issues, so you can go on there and open a ticket. Um, but in some cases where I was able to locate an email address, I also contacted them that way. So I pl split the services into two groups. One of them, the idea was initially to invite them to participate in an online survey, and the other group was going to be invited to participate in an interactive interview online. And then after they received two invitations, for that method, they're not going to be swapped. And this is order to maximise response rates, but also to see which method worked better when recruiting this type of population. So I said we, meant we identified 63 booters. However, 12 of those were actually offline during the three-month data collection period. So overall, Invitations were sent to 51 providers. Um, and these, on average, received 2.5 invitations. So some of them replied straight away, some of them were offline at various times, um, and some of them also declined to participate. Overall, we've received 13 participants, um, which was a 25% response rate, which is actually really good for an offender population. 11 of those opted to do the online survey, and two of them opted to do the interactive interview. We had for both of these a, a mixture of closed and open-ended questions, which we analysed both qualitatively and quantitatively, although mainly descriptively. And also participants didn't have to answer all questions. So of course, not all the participants um, or people I contacted replied positively, so some people were wary about being scammed. Others claimed to know me, and perhaps they did. Some politely declined, very politely, I thought. And some declined a little bit more forcefully. Someone also apparently DDoSed me, um, although I was sitting on Janet at the time and didn't notice anything, so yay for university networks. So let's have a look at those that did respond, starting with their demographics. So all respondents, all respondents that answered this question were male or selected other. And the responses for other included being alien and being a trigendered pyrofox, which in case you don't know is a reference to a cyanide and happiness webcomic. I had to look that up. All were relatively young, aged between 16 to 24 years, with one aged 25 to 34. And we didn't ask more specific because we wanted to keep it general because um, we didn't want to be able to identify it, um, participants. They said they've been providing Buddha services for between eight months to three years, and they mainly lived in the US. And this was consistent with most services being offered in US dollars. 
Only one said they had below proficient computer skills, as we asked them to self-rate themselves. And the others advised they either had proficient or advanced skills. Now, I mentioned earlier they felt unlikely that people just kind of woke up and decided to start providing these services. And indeed, there was an escalation in offending. So some people began using offender, uh, booting services, then offering themselves. And some actually went on to offer multiple Buddha sites. In addition to Buddha services, we asked them what other things they were involved in. And they came back with a mixture of legitimate and illegitimate activities. So more legal side include things like coding, pen testing, web development and hosting. However, on the more potentially illegal side included setting up other Buddha services, operating phone number geolocators and PayPal limitation services, which I'm assuming refers to restoring PayPal limited accounts. One later advised, um, he later advertised to me um, that he could hack Facebook accounts with prices starting at 30 US dollars. So there are two main themes for the pathway into providing Buddha services. These were the influence of others and exposure to Buddha services to the gaming and online communities. Sometimes they had a, what they call a friend who was already providing the services and they said they took over. I'm not really sure what that means or helped out. Now operators used various techniques to justify, excuse or neutralize their actions. And one of these was appealing to higher loyalties. So they reported they provided services for the purpose of network, stress, uh, network testing and stressing. And these services were for the common good and they provided more secure systems overall. However, they also acknowledged that most attacks were against gaming sites and TeamSpeak servers. They denied responsibility. So they claimed that hosting providers should take more responsibility and protect their clients against attack. And they also argued that responsibility falls with the user of the service and not the provider of the service. And they claimed that their site's terms and conditions protected themselves against any legal action. They also condemn the condemners, with one participant saying that, you know, in comparison with other disgusting forms of online content like pornography and other disgusting videos, that Buddha services really were not so bad. And financial gain was the main reason provided for operating these services, although a sense of excitement was also evident within their answers. We also asked participants what proportion of their income was provided by Buddha services. And here the responses were fairly evenly distributed, from 10% or less right through to over 90%. And we did some calculations and we estimated that Buddha services were earning participants between 3,000 705 and 5,430 US dollars per month. The most disruption that was experienced by the operators related to receiving payment, with participants reporting that during this period, PayPal were regularly shutting down their accounts. Now you might have noticed that the estimated um, income is lower than those that estimates that have been made using leaked databases. And we think this is because of some bias here in the data. Um, so those that are hacked and leaked are more likely to be large operators, um, more likely to be targeted and therefore have a higher income. So I said I wanted to see what works best interviews or surveys. 
So the online surveys had a higher response rate. And this is probably because you can do it right there and then. You don't have to reply to me, you don't have to make it time, provide contact details in order to do an interactive interview. However, the interactive interviews provided more in-depth and thoughtful answers. They provided myself with the opportunity to ask further questions, further probing questions about the responses they provide and to have them expand on certain topics. And also there were fewer unanswered questions. Overall, respondents were not concerned that law enforcement would take action against them. And this perhaps explains why such a large proportion were willing to speak to me, because it was low risk. It would be interesting to see what deterrent effect, effect, if any, there'll be after the recent police actions. Particularly, are offenders going to perceive the risk as being higher and then perhaps lay low for a while? Or are they going to go, hey, wait a sec, all my competitors are being taken out. <laughs> this is a great time to really kind of step up and fill the gap in the market that's been left. At the time I did my research, Buddha service providers were using mainly amplification methods to conduct their attacks. However, with the release of the Mirai source code and the availability of insecure Internet of Things devices, this may have implications for the market for and delivery of denial of service attacks. The provision of criminal services is constantly evolving. And denial of service attacks will continue to have twists and turns in the story. And perhaps with contributions to the narrative by social scientists such as myself, as well as computer scientists. So Buddha service providers were found to follow the, the technical trajectory at least when it comes to initiation through the influence of others and learning the techniques of neutralization and maintenance, so the continuation of offending. Although I did not speak to former providers of Buddha services, my previous research into cybercrime offenders indicates that assistance may follow a rational choice perspective. So offenders may stop when the perceived benefits no longer um, exceed the um, perceived costs. Previously, costs have not been limited by those imposed by the criminal justice system, um, and the perception has been that it's because they've been unlikely to be detected. Be interested to see if that changes. Um, instead, they've stopped mainly due to the amount of time spent online and the interference this has with their pro-social activities such as employment and kind of ageing out of crime. So I've published more details about this research, which you can read in the criminology journal Deviant Behaviour. <laughs> An accepted version is also available on my website. Um, so this is a version that um, for those that hit a paywall who are not on a university network, for example, um, it's a draft version, so um, the final version before the publishers basically make things look pretty and typeset it. So where are we from here? Well, I'm still asking questions about select types of cybercrime. We received further funding and set up the Cambridge Cybercrime Centre. So under Richard Clayton's directorship, we're focusing on making data, cybercrime data, available for researchers. I'm also expanding my PhD research. So I'm interviewing not only active and former offenders, but computer security researchers. I'm interested in finding out why some people commit cybercrime why some people fight cybercrime, and why some people are involved in both. 
If any of you fit into any of those categories and would like to speak to me about participating in my research, come and find me during the conference or you can contact me on the details here. Participation is voluntary and anonymous, so I don't retain any information about who it is that I speak to that can be used to re-identify them. I'm also bound by strict ethics requirements relating to human research, so there's some assurances there. Um, so, I think we have time for questions for anyone who would like to quiz me about what I've done. This is a first, no one. <laughs> one at the back. Um, no, and the reason for that is kind of going back to the ethics requirements in that because of the law enforcement interest in this area, I didn't want to be able to have any information that could be used by law enforcement if, for example, they subpoenaed me and ordered me to provide this data. Um, so I thought it best not to collect that and not to do any analysis on that. Any other questions? No? If not, if you are a researcher, reach out to Alice on Twitter or email and help her out with her research. Thanks a lot, Alice, and let's give her a hand. <laughs>